Well, welcome everyone. My name is Christine and I'm a children's librarian from the Arroyo Seco Regional Branch of the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm joined by Ken here, uh, who is the children's librarian from the Cypress Park Branch Library. Hello everyone, thank you for watching. Yes, so it is our pleasure to welcome you to today's Your Author series featuring author Helena Kuri. Uh, so you may remember her as the author of the highly acclaimed Paper Kingdom. And today she will be discussing Rosa's song. Here it is right here. It's her newest work. Please feel free to share your comments or your questions in the chat box. And we will be sure to answer those toward the end, end of the program. And don't forget to email ecdept at lapl.org for your chance to enter into a drawing to win a copy of Rosa's song. And of course, we want to thank our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard, Bernard A. Greenberg Fund, as well as the Library Foundation and our amazing behind the scenes staff for helping the library bring these author and illustrator programs to you virtually. So I just wanna say thank you very much. Thank you so much. And Los Angeles Public Library would also like to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land. We recognize and acknowledge their elders past and present, as well as their descendants. For information on which territory, for information on which territory or land you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. Again, that is native-land.ca. Thank you, Ken. All right, so in today's Your Author program, we have local author, Helena, and she'll be dis discussing Rosa's song, as we said. This is a diverse picture book where we are meeting a young immigrant who finds community and friendship in the apartment house that is filled with a lot of other newly arrived kids. So let's welcome Helena. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Christine and Ken. That was a really nice introduction and thank you to everyone at the library. So good to see you. Nice um, to see you. Yeah, thank you um, for mentioning Rose's song. I am going to delve into the story a little bit, just the first few pages and explain how the book was made because um, actually the story is based on my personal history. I grew up here in LA in uh, an apartment building very close to downtown LA in an area called Koreatown. It was a very diverse population. Uh, what made my building a little bit unusual was that there were a lot of people constantly moving in and out. And so um, my book is really about a short-lived but life-changing friendship. And so um, let's move on to the slides. So here are two images of the cover. And you'll see my name, Helena Kuri, and pa the illustrator, Pascal Campion, at the bottom. And you'll wonder, you're probably wondering why I'm showing two images of the exact same cover. And the answer is because they're not the same. If you look closely, um, the image on the left side has the pet parrot very close to the characters and a lot of musical notes floating in the air. Whereas on the other cover, you see the bird sitting on the ledge of a window and the characters are a little bit further in the distance. And the reason why I'm showing these two different covers is because one became the final cover of the book. And that one is the one where the bird and the characters are shown close up. And the art director at the publishing company, Penguin Random House, made this really great decision to do this because the pet parrot whose name is Polito, is a very central character in the story. And so they thought that it would be a good idea to bring all of the characters closer to the viewer, which I thought was a great, great decision. Okay, next slide. And this is what is known as the end paper. As soon as you open the book, you arrive at the end papers. Um, this is before you launch into the story. And the reason why I wanted to show this is because you see the two characters, Rosa and Pollito, as well, Rosa and Jay, as well as the bird Pollito. They're going on all these fantastic adventures, but these adventures are only in their imaginations. 
they don't actually go on these adventures. It's just only in their brains because all of my stories that I've written so far, they touch upon the power of a person's imagination because an imagination, if you have a really active one, it can do so many miraculous things. It can make a boring day into a fun day. Um, you can go on trips around the world in your head. I, I think it's like so fascinating. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and here we arrive at the title page. Polito means little chicken in Spanish or chick. And I'm showing you the cover page because again, the pet parrot is featured front and center on the on the title page. Now, this is the page that authors and illustrators sign. Um, so this is a special page to me because I've been spending a lot of time on this page at my local bookstore signing books. So um, I love how this page looks. Okay, next slide, please. Now we launch into the story. Jay was new to the country, the city, the building. I love this page because I love the way Pascal captured how when you new, move to a new city or a new country in my situation or a new building, there's kind of this quiet anticipation. You're kind of looking forward to things. You're a little bit nervous. You don't know how your life will turn out. And so I feel like this page really captures that quiet anticipation. Next slide, please. His family's apartment faced an alley and Jay looked out the window. If he stared hard enough, would he be able to see his old village, his old home, his old friends? No, he'd moved too far away. What I find really cool about this image is that, um, you know, I worked with the illustrator Pascal to determine what the inside of the apartment should look like. He originally sent me the interior sketches and said, Helena, how do you how do you think this looks? And it was really funny because he originally had a lot of moving boxes and the apartment looked a little bit fancy. And so I had to give him feedback. And I said, actually, Pascal, um, the building is supposed to be kind of um, uh, a little bit shabby. And so he changed the interior. And so it's a little bit more representative of what my childhood building looked like. And we didn't have a lot of things when we moved to the US or into this building. So you only see a couple of boxes next to my character, Jay. Next slide, please. His mother said, you should go meet the other kids in the building. What if they don't like me? What if I forget my new words? You won't know if you just stay here. Jay put on his shoes and went downstairs to the apartment below his. He rang the bell. And I love when the illustrations come in because I get to see how the illustrator interprets the story. My building actually did not really look like this. It had a, it was in LA, so there was a big central courtyard like a lot of buildings in LA have. And the stairwell was kind of on the outside. It wasn't an interior stairwell. Mm -hmm. stairwell. So you could see the sky, um, you could see the outside street as you walk down the stairs. But I thought it was interesting that Pascal made this decision. Okay, next slide. A girl opened the door. A colorful bird sat on her shoulder. Hi, she said, I'm Rosa. This is my pet parrot, Pollito. It means little chicken. Jay giggled. Good name, he said, using the new words he'd learned. Rosa asked, can I visit your apartment? I wanna see where you live. Jay started heading upstairs. Rosa followed with Polito on her shoulder. Jay liked how friendly Rosa was and how Polito nestled by her ear. And you can already get a sense of the different personalities between Jay and Rosa. Jay is a little quiet. He's a little bit um, shy. And Rosa is the complete opposite. She's very friendly, outgoing, and social. And that was a decision I made as a writer. I wanted characters who were completely different from each other. And Pollito, you'll see later on in the story, if you borrow the, library, the book from the library, is a little bit more like Rosa. Next slide, please. Inside, Jay turned to Rosa and said, no shoes. He removed his sneakers. Rosa did the same. As Rosa looked around the apartment, her eyes gleamed as if she discovered something amazing. She studied a vase with a dragon and colorful rice cakes on the kitchen table. And again, 
Pascal wanted to know how the interior should look in Jay's apartment. And so I actually sent him a photo of uh, what my family apartment looked like. Not, not the one I grew up in when, when I was really little, but one that I grew up in when I was a teenager. And he, it's really funny because he included the exact plant that my mom had in her house. It's the spiky plant in the white vase. And that was featured in the photo I gave to him. So um, I, I showed it to my mom. So she was laughing about that because she was like, I know that plant. And so um, this image is really cool because it, rep it really represents how I grew up. The building where I grew up as a kid, there were kids from all different cultures. And so um, a lot of the kids who became my friends didn't really know about removing your shoes before stepping into your apartment, which is a, a tradition that my family adhered to because we're Asian. And so it's very common. And so a lot of times they would kind of run in without remembering to remove their shoes. And it's a common reminder that I had to give them. So um, I really like the scene because it represents uh, so much of what I had to do when I was a kid, which is to remind my friends, please remove your shoes. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, that's that's um, the amount of the story that I will share today, but I do hope you borrow the book from the library so that you can go on the adventures that Jay and Rosa go on in their building. And now I wanted to talk about this slide because Rosa's Song is a companion book to my prior book, The Paper Kingdom. And if you can, if you can notice the um, similarities between the two covers, the two same teams worked on these two books, the same author, who is me, the same illustrator, who is Pascal Campion, and the same publishing company. And so they wanted to capture the same look and feel. So the, the images kind of call back to each other. You see the main characters on the cover, the writing kind of looks a little bit similar. The colors are very, very vibrant. There are things floating on the cover like musical notes or papers. So um, I love what the publishing company did. And it was the decision probably of the art director and the editor and the publishing company to do this. And I just love the bookmaking process. And um, if you could just uh, bring me back on screen, that'd be very cool. <laughs> Hi again. I wanted to actually show a little bit of the bookmaking process before I jump into Ken and Christine's questions. Okay. So before Rosa's Song became this hardcover book, it was actually a soft cover folded and gathered copy. So this is just a bunch of loose leaf pages that come apart. And the reason why the publishing company does this is because they make these just a few, just a handful of these to send to reviewers, uh, bookstores to get early interest in the book and also to see if there are any mistakes that need to be captured before the final book is made. And so I wanted to show you a little bit about how this is done because some people in the audience, I have a feeling, might become authors or illustrators. So this is something you can look forward to. And as an author, I got a couple of these copies that um, I was able to give to, um, you know, people that I cared about or people that I wanted to show an early cover to. And I, I remember showing this to my parents and kind of explaining to them, this is going to be my book. And they said, oh, it's so flimsy this time. I said, no, 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 no. This is just the very early copy. This is this won't be the ones that people see at the library or the bookstore. So it was kind of fun explaining to them the whole bookmaking process. And I wanted to share that with you. Yeah, a lot of people don't know about them. They're called ARCs, right? Yeah, arcs or folded and gathered, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Helena. It's really nice to meet you. Like Likewise. I said, I know I already said hi, but I wanted to say hi again, and thank you so much. It's thank a pleasure you. to talk to you about Rosa's song. Um, I just wanted to tell you first that I really, really enjoyed this book a lot. It has a lot of layers to it, and I've read it multiple times. And each time I read it, I, I enjoy it more and more and find new things about it that I really enjoy. Actually, one thing I, that you just mentioned right now was the whole thing about no shoes because I, yeah. I actually did grow up in a an Asian community and my friends were, uh, I, yeah, I had friends of different cultures and backgrounds. So I do remember that as a child going to my friend's house downstairs and they're like, no, you can't put your shoes on. And I'm like, 
oh, okay. Oh, okay. And so like, you know, I did it. I went yeah. inside and enjoyed, enjoyed my day. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was, I, for some reason, I just, when you said that, I just, it just kind of sparked a memory and that was really neat. Oh, that's cool. That's kind of what I liked about yeah. this book because I also grew up in apartments um, as a child and uh, had adventures and with yeah. all my, all my friends and used our imagination Exactly. And I really connected with this book because I, I don't know, for some reason, I don't really see too much, too many books where there's like a character that kind of looks like me that uh, yeah. in the mm -hmm. and meets up with uh, people of different cultures. Cause that's what I, I came across as a child. So I really, I just really liked that. And I really connected to that. So oh, I just thanks so to, much, Ken. I want to say thank you so much uh, for writing this book. And uh, let's see. Um, okay. So now let's get to know more about your uh, creative process and uh, your work with Rose's song. Like, sure. And uh, like I said, it's a, a fabulous book and I re do recommend it. Thank and, you. Uh, okay, so we do have some questions for you. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, question number one. <laughs> yeah. Are Jay and Rosa inspired by any, any real people? Yes, they are. So Jay is actually my dad's name. But what's really interesting is that my father is more like Rosa and Jay is more like me. I was a pretty shy and pretty quiet kid, whereas my dad is kind of the life of the party, extremely social. Um, and also, uh, I after college graduation, I spent a couple of months in South America. And so a lot of um, Rosa's background comes from that inspiration of my spending a couple of months in South America. And then, of course, Jay, being from South Korea, he shares my heritage. Yeah, so that's a good question. I do have a question. Does uh, Jay, um, now I, I know there's Boito, that's a character in the story. Yeah. And then Jay kind of has a similar word as Blue Jay. Is there, is there was there, oh. is, I don't know, I just somehow connected that. And I didn't know if that was like. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't even think of that. Jay is a pretty common Korean name. And so, you know, it's my dad's name. So I plug that in there. But that's a that's a good observation because there's a pet bird as a character. Yeah. That's kind of and, cool. And uh, the other question is, where do you imagine that they came from, I guess, prior to when they met up in Rosa's song? Yeah, I imagine that. So Jay is coming from South Korea, like like I did when I first moved to Los Angeles. I came directly from South Korea. And I imagine Rosa to be from Peru. Um, a country that I loved while I was uh, visiting South America. Okay. okay. Well, you kind of mentioned these different places, and I know from your author bio in your book that you've lived in different places too. So can you tell us some of your favorite places where you've lived or worked and how yeah. they influenced your work? Sure. I feel like we're so lucky to be Earthlings. There are so many wonderful places on this planet. And I just hope that we do a good job of taking care of it for many, many, many years to come because there's so much to be loved about this, this planet. And um, I still feel like there's so much I haven't discovered even though I've traveled quite a bit. And in terms of a couple of places that have really inspired me, okay, so there's South Korea, I lived there, I was born there. And then after college, I lived there for a year. And then of course there's South America where I spent a couple of months. And the place that I really felt connected to was actually Paris. I also lived there for about a year as a young adult and it just really fuels my imagination. And I've been for several years working on a novel based in Paris. It's just, I feel like everything there is taken to the level of art, whether it's a doorknob or a, a vase or underwear. <laughs> They make everything look like art, which is incredible. Cool. All right. Um, okay, so illustration, uh, illustration, illustration does tell a story. And how do you go about connecting the written word to the images that are in the story? A good question. And I think a, a question that people who want to be authors or illustrators would be interested in. So the way um, picture books are published is that the author the writer first writes the story, the words, and then the publishing company hires the illustrator. And so um, the illustrator first tries to match the vision to the words. 
but invariably there's always going to be tweaking necessary by the writer. For instance, I have a, I have a tendency to um, write a lot of descriptions like, oh, he was wearing a red shirt or there was a blue sofa in the room. And the illustrations are going to show that. So you don't need to write that in the story because it's already there in the drawing. So um, after I get the sketches or the images from the illustrator, I tweak the story a little bit so that nothing is repeated in my words because um, the illustrations are doing a lot of the legwork. So I don't need to repeat some of the things like the colors of the hair or the colors of the clothes if they're already shown in the images. Okay. Um, do you have any hidden meanings or Easter eggs in your books? Uh, yeah, I kind of do. So um, what's really cool about children's books, I personally believe that children's books are for everyone, not just kids. I think adults can get a lot out of um, children's books if they read them, because children's books hold a lot of hope and a lot of good things about humanity that I think can be lost as people get stressed out with jobs and the world. So I really encourage everyone to read children's books. And I actually wrote an article recently for salon.com about just this. So um, if you go to my website, you'll see the link. But anyway, um, circling back to your question about Easter eggs, I think when kids read the book, they'll see a story about a friend moving away and how Jay heals from that experience. But when a grown up reads the book, they will know exactly why Rosa has to move away. And that ties back to current events. When I was writing the book, um, the 2020 presidential election was about to take place and there was a lot of debate in our country about what it means to be American. And a lot of people took a very narrow viewpoint. Um, and so a lot of families were separated at the border, a lot of heartbreaking things happened. And so I wanted to show what it's like to see families being uprooted. That happened when I was a kid. Um, some of my friends were kind of torn away from their lives, their dreams, which was really heartbreaking to see. And I didn't really know that when I was a kid. I thought, oh my goodness, where did they go? But as I grew older and became more aware of what was happening in the world, I knew exactly why they had to leave and why they left so quickly. Um, and so, um, that's a hidden meaning. And also, a friend of mine told me that the word pollito has a hidden meaning. It means little chicken, but it also means something else in, in common um, contemporary Spanish. And if you look it up, I think you'll find it. And it ties back to what's going on in the story. Um, I won't reveal that because it's a mystery for the audience. Some of them may already know. But um, yeah, my friend who speaks fluent Spanish told me about that. And I was like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that when I named the parrot Pollito. I just thought it was a cute little name, but it actually means something that ties back to the story, which is kind of cool and um, kind of mysterious. Yeah. And I kind of, like uh, I was saying before, I did connect with, with the book too, because I yeah. also, since I did live in apartments uh, and I did have my friends there, and then suddenly the next day they would also I had a few friends that would be gone also, and yeah. um, I'm not really sure what happened to them or where they went, but uh, you know, it's still several decades later. Yeah. I, uh, I still have those fond memories of them, and uh, so yeah, again, that's a connection. To I share the same exact story, and I bet a lot of people who grew up in um, immig immigrant communities, I think they are probably well aware of these sorts of things, yeah. um, and I'm hoping it'll just introduce a lot of people who aren't familiar with this type of experience to what a kid can experience in places like LA where we live. Yeah. Um, also something that's, that was kind of hidden in your, in your book that I noticed was that the, the, the wallpaper of the, uh, your, the wallpaper of your apartment oh, had yeah. like mermaids and whales and starfish, I believe. And I had like a nautical sort of. Oh, that's interesting. Imagery. Yeah. yeah. I really liked that. Yeah, uh, um, I'll have to ask Pascal about that because I did notice it too. And I thought maybe, oh, it's like a, he's French American. So I thought, oh, maybe it's like a fancy French thing. 
because we just had white, regular white walls in our apartment. So oh. maybe I thought maybe he was adding like a little elegant touch. I don't know, but I'll have to ask him about that. It's yeah. So sp speaking of Pascal, um, mm -hmm. how was it collaborating with the illustrator for the second time? Oh, yeah. So um, I've been very fortunate in that, you know, this is another um, secret about publishing children's books. Usually the author and the illustrator, they don't communicate at all. The reason being that the publishing company wants the illustrator to do their part without the author constantly giving input or the author constantly, you know, exerting their opinion on what the illustrator should do. So usually they're kept pretty separate. But with um, The Turtle Ship, my very first book, uh, illustrated by the talented artist Colleen Kong Savage, and also with The Paper Kingdom and Rosa's Song, illustrated by Pascal Kepian, we all became friends. That was so cool. And so now, um, and our publishers are well aware of this, so it's totally fine. Um, so now, whenever Pascal has a question or Colleen had a question, they would just text me. And it just became so easy and collaborative. And um, I really loved working, uh, that sort of working experience because I had heard that authors and illustrators are kept separate. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a shame because you're working on the same thing, the same book, the same story. Um, but yeah, I've been very fortunate to call them friends. Yeah. That's actually something I didn't know. I thought there was a lot of collaboration between both. Yeah, not usually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's uh, ask another question. So there is a song that the character Rosa sings to Jay. The words mm -hmm. in the song are, when I fly away, my heart stays here. So what was the reasoning for these lyrics and what is its importance to Rosa? I love that question because honestly, that, um, that line in the book, the lyrics of the song, I worked so hard on it. It <laughs> probably was the most difficult um, part of the book that I had to write simply because I wanted that lyric to kind of foreshadow what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the story. And the, um, the lyric is translated into Spanish and my friends Caroline and Stephanie helped me because they're fluent in Spanish to tweak that phrase. and. Um, it's a love song that Rosa leaves with Jay, and it's a gift to him that will help him later on when Rosa is no longer around. And um, there's another gift that's left behind for Rosa. And when readers read the entire story, they will see what that gift is in addition to the song. Oh, that's so lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's, re that's really nice. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I actually relate a lot to music and songs and, and yeah. music and I, yeah, I, I, I love it. So uh, yeah, that's really nice. Um, do you have any uh, favorite songs or musicians that influenced, influenced your book? Oh, that's a really interesting question. And it's like, I always sweat when I hear this question because I have so many favorite songs and so many types of music I enjoy, just like I have so many favorite books. It's hard to pinpoint one. But I will tell you a song that I listened to a lot at night while I was drafting this story. I kind of had it on repeat. It's um, Harvest Moon by Neil Young. And it's also got a really great rendition by Cassandra Wilson. It's kind of like a nighttime lullaby. It's also a love song. And I had it on repeat a lot of the time, kind of puts me in a peaceful mode. Um, I don't usually listen to music while I write, but I do listen to it sometimes before I go to sleep and I'm sure the subconscious is still working and that sort of um, mode, the mood is captured probably in my stories too. Hmm. Okay, so this may be a related question. Mm -hmm. How did the quarantine change your writing habits or your space? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so this might be a, a controversial answer because I know a lot of people struggled with quarantine, mm. but quarantine, I loved it. <laughs> it really suited my personality because when I'm not traveling, I'm a natural homebody. And so the, the fact that the world just kind of quieted down, I didn't have a ton of social obligations to go to. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to work from home. It 
really um, was quite good for my um, my creative journey. Um, of course, during the first few months of quarantine, it was kind of hard. The pandemic was hard on everybody. So I didn't write at all during that time. But afterwards, after quarantine became a year and a half long thing, um, I was finally able to, um, I, I used to only write during the weekends because I had no time, but I was finally able to have enough quiet time during the weekdays to have about two hours during the weekdays to write, whether that be early in the morning or late at night. So that was actually quite nice. Um, I know the pandemic was pretty awful, um, really awful for some of my friends, but I'm fortunate enough to say that um, lockdown, being at home was actually really, really good for me. That's great. Yeah. And uh, so you said you didn't, you don't listen to music when you're you're writing. No, I don't listen to music. So if 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 I give you a snapshot of what it's like when I write, I'm in this room, usually on the sofa, with my dog snoring next to me, and uh, with a cup of tea and absolute silence. Uh, I find that um, music, even music without lyrics. I get so um, distracted. I must be a really sensitive person because my mind starts flittering over to the notes and the crescendos and all that stuff. Yeah. And so I, I try to keep absolute focus on the words on my page rather than listening to music. I know a lot of my writer friends listen to music all the time and they have a playlist and they have a playlist for different manuscripts that they're writing. And I've never been able to do that. Even when I was a student, high school and college, I could never work at a cafe. A lot of people I knew studied at a cafe and said hello to their friends. I was never one of those. I had to be in my room or in a very quiet library. They used to call them cubbies. In, or a weenie bin, in a weenie bin. Yeah, and I, oh, shout out to my college friends. I know a few of them are here, so I'm wearing blue in honor of my school. <laughs> and uh, kind of related to that too, how did you go about developing your writing, uh, your writing style? Uh, yes, I love this question because I think um, as writers, your writing style evolves. And I always thought that writing would become easier and easier the more you did it. And honestly speaking, every new book that I try to write is still a struggle. And I'm being completely honest here. You have to really be devoted to the craft and you really have to love what you're doing because it doesn't get easier. Um, what does get easier is that, you know, after you've written your first book, you know that it's a possibility that it can be a real book. That part is very encouraging and you know that people will possibly read your story. So that part is very encouraging and it gives you the hope and the inspiration to go forward. But the actual sitting down at your computer or your notebook and putting down words to make a good story, that never ever gets easier. Um, and so I tell anybody who's an aspiring author that they really have to love the journey because the journey is so full of ups and downs. And I always thought that once I got my first book published, oh, it would be like sitting on a cloud and I can just whip out new pages and send them to the publishing company and I would have a million books on the shelves. No, that does not happen. You can still get rejected all the time as a published author. You're, you might write a new story and your same publisher who loved your prior story may not love your next story. And so it's a constant struggle, constant growth. And so that keeps life interesting. And I just want to say real quick that, you know, picture books really are a work of art, in my opinion. Yeah, You know, there's like a few things I really love. I love architecture and, and the desert. And for me, like, and picture books, you know, and I feel like picture yeah. books, although I know they're aimed at children, I feel like adults and teens and really people of all ages can appreciate them because of the artistry in the in the words and mm -hmm. and in the in, in the in the imagery. So I just I don't know. I completely agree with you. And when I was in high school and throughout college, I still read picture books. I collected them. I still do as an adult. 
And, um, you know, for a while there, I used, when I was in high school, especially, I was a little bit embarrassed about admitting to my friends, I still read picture books because it seems kind of childish, but it's absolutely not. They are true works of art. I mean, you, you have artists working at the highest caliber, um, creating these images and writing a satisfying story in less than 1000 words or less, which is the word limit of picture books. That's really challenging. Um, how you have to have a, a beginning, middle and end, a character arc, all that stuff in less than a thousand words. It takes so much effort, so many revisions to get it there. And so I completely agree with you, Ken. Right. I agree too. One of my favorite parts of the job is looking at all the new picture books that come through every month and they're just all so beautiful. <laughs> okay. For sure. I I thought we can maybe go through some of our comments. We have a lot of comments and, and a few questions related to publishing and writing. Yeah, uh, of course. I thought this question was interesting. The printed writing looks small. How do you select the size of the font? And as a person with poor eyesight, I can I can sometimes struggle with things that are really small. <laughs> do you oh, have a say in that? Yeah, no, I don't have a say in that, but you're right. You know, the book font can vary from book to book. Mm -hmm. And so I know my mom, for instance, has a hard time reading because um, she likes larger font. And so I can totally identify with that concern, but it's a, it's the choice of the publishing company. And a lot of times the size of the font is um, uh, related to how the images appear on page because you want the text to be not in the way of the images. And I will show you um, some of the other images. For instance, a lot of picture books has full spread images. That means that the image spans two pages and all across. And so the text has to be somewhere out of the way. And so it can be a little small because of that. And here you see Rosa and Jay on one of their imaginary adventures. And the book, it looks like it's falling apart because it's the, it's the soft cover that I showed you earlier. But yes, um, it's all kind of related to the sizing and the appearance of the images in picture books. Okay, I'll ask another question. Ken, you could take another one after that. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm scrolling through. Okay, so I love this question. Did you have a Rosa in your childhood? Oh, that's a really wonderful question. And it makes me think of so many childhood friends. Rosa is kind of a combination of a lot of friends that I had. There was one friend in particular who always lingers in my memory. I lost touch with her, unfortunately. But the, the way we became friends was, so in my apartment complex, I told you about there was a courtyard in the middle. And so there were windows facing the courtyard. And sometimes if people left their curtains open, you could see inside their homes. And their homes were all small. I lived in a one bedroom apartment. And there was this girl who would always kind of stand outside our window during mealtime. And I thought maybe she was not of my background. And I thought maybe she thought what we were eating was weird. And so one day I confronted her and I said, why are you there? Why do you keep hanging around my house, my apartment? And she said, can I be invited to eat with you? And I said, okay. And so she had a Korean meal with us. And I'm sure a lot of people in LA are familiar with Korean meals, but maybe some people in the audience may not be. You don't get one plate per person. Instead, you get a bowl of rice, maybe some soup and a ton of side dishes. There might be 10. Um, 10 different side dishes. So she thought it was fascinating that we were all sharing these dozens of little dishes. So she came and she enjoyed a meal with us and she fell in love with kimchi, which is pickled cabbage. And she ran home to her apartment and asked her mom, can you make kimchi? <laughs> and of course her mom didn't know what kimchi was. And so what was really cool was my mom and her mom started swapping foods. Her mom would make a zucchini bread and my mom would give her family uh, jars of kimchi. So it was like this cool cross-cultural exchange, which was one of the amazing things about that building where I grew up. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. No problem. Um, okay. Wait, um, well, I have this question by uh, Judy Pack that, that was actually uh, interesting. It says, uh, when you started writing Rosa's song, 
did you know what the ending would be? I love that question because normally my answer would be no, but this time the answer is yes. I knew, I knew that Jay would go through a little bit of heartbreak and that he would be healed a little bit by the end. Um, I wanted to take my readers on that journey. And a lot of people ask me, how come you write sad books? And I don't think that this book is too sad. Um, it is because it's reflective of what I went through as a kid. And Ken, it sounds like you can identify with this sort of experience of a lot of friends just moving away without any warning. Um, but I, you know, one of the things that children's books have to do is to leave their audience with a sense of hope. And that's what I did at the end. Jay takes those gifts from Rosa and he shares them with new kids who arrive in his building. And that's how he begins the healing process by sharing Rosa's gifts. And um, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to use our good memories, our strong memories that carry us through life. You know, our current days are so full of hardship um, if you just turn on the news, it's just so depressing. I don't watch the news all that often these days because so many bad things have been happening, um, especially in our country these days. So, you know, one thing that I do is I turn to children's books for a sense of solace, comfort, and hope. And I'm hoping that that's what Rosa's song will provide too. Okay. And uh, do you have any... Um advice for our youth who want to become an author? Any tips? Any? I do. I'm, I'm very prepared for this question and I have a slide. Oh, um, awesome. Yes, yeah, Steve is in the background. If you wouldn't mind pulling up the writer's tip slide, I believe it's on slide 11. Yes, tips for writing. And this applies to anyone, kids and grownups alike. Dream big, free your imagination. No matter how weird your story is, just write it. Somebody might really relate to your story. Um, the imagination is probably the number one tool in your writer's toolkit. So exercise it, really, really free your mind. And the next one is read a lot. Read the books you love over and over again. There are a handful of books that I read almost every year for inspiration. So read a lot. Number three is write and don't try to be perfect. Whenever I try to be perfect, I stop writing. So you have to write because you can and not be perfect because you can fix it later. And number four is a bit of advice I probably I learned from a, a, an author. And it's probably the best advice that I received, which is listen to your heart to know what to write. And what that means is think about something that makes you laugh or that makes you cry, something that makes you feel very, very strongly because your readers are reading to feel something. So if you feel something, your readers will feel something. And number five, a lot of uh, students, when I do school visits, groan when I say this, but revision is your friend. <laughs> it is probably um, what is going to make your story perfect. Revise, revise. Take out words, repetitive words. Make your story more streamlined. Number six, ask someone who loves to read to review your work. And what I want to point out is, someone who loves to read, not someone who loves you, someone who loves to read. Now that's a different thing. Someone who loves to read will know what's a good story and you want honest feedback. People who love you, sometimes they won't necessarily give you honest feedback because they're afraid of hurting your feelings. But as a writer, you have to get used to getting critical feedback. And sometimes it may not always be a shiny gold star, but as a writer, that's what you want. You want good, sometimes hard feedback. And number seven is read some more. And actually let's flip to the next slide. This relates to number one, free your imagination. Okay, I've always had a very wild imagination. And so you see on the image here, my dog Sherwin and an image of the actor Clint Eastwood. And the reason why I put these side by side is sometimes when I look at my dog Sherwin, I see Clint Eastwood and I'm not kidding. I see the face of Clint Eastwood in my dog. And one time I was sitting in my front yard and um, uh, a neighbor walked by and said, 
your dog looks like a Marine. And I started laughing because the neighbor imagined a tough guy in my dog. And that's exactly what I see. Okay, next slide, please. And again, tied back to freeing your imagination. Here's a costume party at I attended where I dressed up like the author R.L. Stein, who writes Goosebumps. They're scary stories for kids. And the reason why it ties back to imagination is because I don't like to spend too much money on costumes or costume parties or, ha or Halloween. Even as a kid, I always use my imagination to use uh, to create costumes. And so I just dug through my closet and my bookshelf to find a costume that imitates R.L. Stein, and I actually sent this photo to him and he wrote back and gave me a thumbs up. So I thought, okay, I did a good job. Okay, and I'll go back to the full screen. And I really like that. Yeah, Sherwin does kind of have a little, little bit of a Clint Eastwood look. I think so, thing. but he's you, a major I goofball. Hear, I can hear that music, you know, the, I can't yes. hear it because of the right do, 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 issues, do. but you know. Wah, yeah. Wah, wah. yeah, the cowboy music. <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. definitely hear that. And, uh, yes. Oh, and also, I do have a quick question because I did. Saw, I saw that you dressed up as R.L. Stein. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering, would would you ever do a scary story for children? Oh, would you ever write a scary yes. Story I have been trying to get a scary story published because I love scary stories. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with the Twilight Zone. Um, I love scary stories that make you think. Um, not necessarily. Uh, gory or bloody stories, but stories that really are a little eerie and get under your skin. I love those. So I would love to get a scary story published someday. And did you like the one with Burgess Meredith with the where he couldn't read? Remember he broke his glass? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's <laughs> so many good ones. Uh, Andy Al has a question. Mm -hmm. It is, how did and how do you balance your writing career with your day job? Thank you for that question. I was hoping that someone would ask about it. So during the day, I work as a VP at Sony Pictures. So it's a storytelling organization. So it kind of ties into what I'm interested in, which is storytelling. Um, but yeah, it can be really intense. So time management is key. A lot of writers say, I must write in the morning or I must write in the afternoon. And I cannot do that because sometimes my mornings and afternoons are busy. You know, I have to devote those hours to my day job. So I told myself at whatever point in the day, whether it be early in the morning before my job or during my lunch break or in the evening afterwards or the weekends, I will devote two hours to writing or three if I can manage it. So I've been trying to do that. That's the way I set my um, writing practice. And it's really I thought that, oh, I'll just write whenever I feel like it. I used to think that way, but no. If you have that kind of mindset, I'll just write when I feel like it. Normally, you won't feel like it because writing is hard. And so you have to build a writing practice. And one of the things that's really helped me is to incorporate um, things that I enjoy with writing. So I only allow myself to have chocolate which i love when i'm writing so that i have something to look forward to while i'm doing the hard work of writing that's a rule that i set for myself i can only have chocolate when i'm actually doing a writing project so i reward myself oh okay well it sounds like you do are devoted to spending a few hours a day so i imagine you must have several stories in your back file somewhere how many books do you normally write in a year <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, so it depends. Picture books are shorter. And so they let take a little less time. Um, and I write a lot of um, essays too, essays for like the LA Times or Salon. And those take less time too. But I've been working away at a novel. So that's kind of in the background. I've been working it, away at it for years. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say I probably work on about five picture books a year at least um one novel also and several personal essays going on but i'm not one of those writers who can work on multiple projects at once i need to devote time and focus on one at a time so what i'll do is i'll be very very obsessed with a picture book for about a month or two 
and then I'll move on to the novel for a while. And that's the way I work. I'm very, very envious of writers who tell me, oh, I work on a novel this day. And then within the same week, I switch over to um, a poet poem collection. I'm not one of those people. I, I've become very, very aware of how I work through the years. So um, I've learned that different ways work for different people. Yeah, there, there's no wrong way. <laughs> yeah, then there's no wrong way. As long as you get it done, there's no wrong way. And I heard that, uh, I forget what video I saw, uh, but you mentioned that uh, the, the little bird, Boyito, in the in the book, Rosa's Song, um, that Sherwin it was sort of the uh, inspiration for Boyito. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So, um, I love parrots too, but I've never had a pet bird. Um, I've learned though, there's a wonderful book called Alex and Me about uh, one of the most brilliant birds ever. And um, I learned that parrots, uh, African gray parrots can have the intelligence of a five or six year old. And I think Sherwin has the intelligence of a seven year old. <laughs> and so I wanted to put a very intelligent animal as a side character or you know actually Porito is a main character and uh, Sherwin is like a main character in my life he gives me so much inspiration um, he's very playful and when I take him on my morning walks that's probably when I do my best thinking um, I get so many ideas when we're walking through the quiet neighborhood and so I really wanted to you know, use that inspiration of Sherwin in the book. And so he directly inspired the character of Poito. Awesome, thank you. Well, I just noticed that we have a viewer from Denmark. So that's exciting. Yay. Hi, Justin. <laughs> Thanks Hi, for Justin. watching. Um, and also Colleen says your chocolate writing idea is brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. <laughs> Hi, Colleen. Yes, so I, I just wanted to just point out that you have a lot of comments congratulating you on this book. Oh, thank you. You have a lot of fans out there. Thank so, you, thank you. Yeah. And uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna do some rapid fire questions real quick. Sure. Um, this is just this is just for fun and allows us to learn a little bit more about you. And we will ask you really quickly, and get, you could tell us which what you prefer, which one you prefer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, like I'm saying, for example, do you like rather eat a carrot or an apple? And then you would say apple, etc. Okay. Okay. Well, here it goes. The um, which one do you pre prefer, uh, dogs or cats? Oh, I'll whisper this one so Sherwin doesn't hear. I love both, but cats don't like me, so. Dogs love me, so I will say I have a preference for dogs, but I love cats too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, absolutely. And yeah, Sherwin, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so beach or mountains? Beach. <laughs> okay, that's great since we're in LA. Yes. Uh, music or quiet when working, I think we- Quiet. Know. Yeah. Um, Night owl or early bird? I'm a night owl naturally, but Sherwin is a morning dog, so I've become a morning person. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Salty or sweet? Sweet, for sure. Summer or winter? Fall and spring. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was fun. So I think that's all we have time for today. So I just want to thank you for joining us, Helena. Yeah, and thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you for so much thank fun. You so much. Thank you, thank you. Yes, and thank you to all the viewers. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with Helena Curry. And please remember to visit lapl.org slash events to see more of our amazing programs. Our next Your Author series will be on July 15th at 4 p.m. And we will be talking with author Tracy Baptiste, who will be discussing her middle grade series, The Jumbies, which is a scary but cheerful tale that draws on Caribbean folk tales. And also, don't forget to sign up for our summer reading challenge. You could visit lapl.org slash summer. Yeah, and wasn't that really fantastic, everyone? I really liked it. Thank you so much, Helena. I really appreciate it. I almost uh, teared up for a moment when you mentioned about that how music affect 
affected the, the character. And I, I don't know, I just like had to stop talking for a moment because I just, I just, I really related to, to that and these characters. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, as always, uh, those attending this virtual program will have an opportunity to win a free book. And uh, also the Cypress Park Library does have a uh, program for children on June 21st at two o'clock, but you'll need to sign up. We have a uh, performer coming. She's gonna read a book to the children for about roughly 10 minutes. And then after that, we're going to make puppets and I have room for about 30 kids, maybe 40. So if you wanna come, come to the Cypress Park Library and sign up and we hope to see you there. And don't forget to sign up for the summer reading program because that's really important. We wanna see you guys reading all through the summer. Yes, that's true. So we are starting to have more um, programs in the branches and we still have a lot on um, virtually. So just remember to check our website and also check <laughs> Aria Seco's Instagram for upcoming programs as well. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye-bye, have a nice day. Thank you for, for stopping by. <laughs>